Why don't we get started again? Welcome back. Um, for people who weren't here yesterday, I do have a USB going around with the model um, as it stands so far, basically up to the point where we stopped yesterday. So make sure you get that. Um, that's where we're going to be picking up today. Any questions on what we did yesterday? Just as a quick review what we did yesterday, because I know a couple people weren't able to make it yesterday but are here today. Basically what we're doing is we're building an LBO model, assuming that company A, that company that we built a financial model for last week, is being acquired as part of a leveraged buyout. We are putting ourselves in the shoes of the private equity firm as though we're trying to decide whether to undertake this transaction. So we're building a model to help us figure out ultimately what is the rate of return associated with this deal and does it meet our hurdle, our required rate of return, does it make sense for us to move forward. Okay, so what we started out by doing yesterday on our sources and uses tab in the model, we put together some transaction assumptions, basically what is the valuation going in that we would be buying the company at. And again, as I explained yesterday, we're taking a bit of a simplistic approach here in that we're just assuming a six times EBITDA multiple for our purchase multiple. In reality, we probably would have done a full-blown valuation in order to figure out that 360 million is in fact the right enterprise value to be valuing this company at for the purchase. Once we had that, we completed what we call a sources and uses of cash schedule, basically figuring out what are all of our cash needs in connection with the transaction. We have to buy out the equity, we've got to refinance the old debt, we've got to pay some fees. And then on the other side, on the sources side, how are we going to fund that? How are we going to finance those cash uses? We're going to do so between a combination of debt as well as some of our own equity. And as it turns out, we're levering this deal 4.5 times on trailing 12 months EBITDA. That is, our debt represents a multiple of EBITDA of 4.5x. And as a percentage of the total capitalization in the deal, we're financing at 72% debt, roughly 28% equity. We also specify all of our interest rates for each, pieces of, each piece of our debt. Revolver, term loans, senior bonds all pay interest in cash, cash interest at the rates that are stated here. And then our mezzanine piece, our unsecured notes with warrants, we're paying our interest in kind. That is, we're going to accrue it to the ending balance each year and eventually pay that when we sell the company. We're also going to need to give that unsecured note holder, the MES lender, a 5% warrant to fully compensate them for the risk that they're taking. Once we did that, once we figured out our sources and uses, and again, sources and uses have to match, kind of like a balance sheet in that regard. If we need $374 million of cash, we'd better be able to raise it, otherwise we can't do a deal. Once we did that, we were able to create what we call a pro forma balance sheet basically giving effect for the transaction immediately after it closes. I mentioned that we're going to be doing a lot of things in connection with the transaction. We're going to be buying out the old equity. We're going to be refinancing the old debt. We're going to be borrowing new debt. All right, so all of these transaction adjustments reflect those items. We're also going to create some goodwill in connection with the deal because the market value of equity is going to exceed the book value. We're also going to create some amortizable intangibles, we're going to be able to keep some of those financing fees, put them on the balance sheet, amortize those over time. And once we take into account all of these transaction adjustments, we get a sense for what the company's balance sheet will look like immediately after the transaction is closed. Again, this is what we refer to as a pro forma balance sheet, which then gets dropped into our model. And as I explained yesterday, we're taking the same model that we built last week for Company A, we're modifying it for a leveraged buyout. So those numbers in the projected financial statements that you see out here should look pretty familiar. It's what we built last week. What we're doing here, we're dropping the pro forma balance sheet in to this new column. And all of our balance sheet changes going forward from a cash flow pr perspective will be keyed off of this pro forma balance sheet. All right, our debt schedule is going to be built using these new debt figures. All right, we'll take that into account later today. This is basically where we left off. What we're going to do now is we're going to pick up. We need to start at the very top of our financial statement, our financial model, and work down basically line by line and see and ask ourselves in each case, how does this transaction affect this individual line item? All right, do our sales change? Do our cost of goods sold change? Does, does our COGS change? 
Those are depreciation, our amortization, et cetera. We're gonna go down all the way through income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, debt schedule. In the debt schedule, we're going to add some line items for that new unsecured, that mezzanine piece. Or actually, the senior bonds are a new addition, so we'll make room for that in our debt schedule. At the end of the day, though, we will have a balanced model, a completely working integrated cash flow model. Our balance sheet will balance as it did last week. Once we have that, we can figure out what do we expect to sell the company for after five years. We're going to key off of latest 12 months EBITDA in that last period. Figure out how much equity is going to be left over to be split between us, the PE firm, and that MES lender who gets the 5% warrant. Once we know our cash flows, we'll calculate returns. IRR to us, IRR to the MES lender. That will help us determine do we want to do the deal. All right, so that's kind of a two-minute overview of what we've done, what we're doing. Um, at the end of class today, we'll also use this. I'll show you how to use this analysis as a fourth valuation methodology. All right, so let's go back to our model tab. And like I said before, we're going to walk straight down, ask ourselves, how does each individual line item get affected? All right. As we talked about yesterday, we're not going to be changing any of our operating assumptions. Okay, we're going to assume, for example, that a revenue growth rate of 5%, cost of goods sold as a percentage of revenue of 40%. All of those operating assumptions we had last week, we're basically going to assume that we buy off on them. Right, we're really going to keep this a little more simple and focus only on um, items that get changed as a result of the transaction itself. So sales don't change, cost of goods sold, gross profit won't change, or depreciation won't change as a result of the deal. The first thing that we're going to have to make a change to is amortization. And I mentioned last week we did not have any amortization at the time, but we did set up the model to accommodate that because I anticipated that later on we might need that. This is where we need that. Because we have those amortization, those financing fees that have been capitalized, those will get amortized over a five-year period, our intended hold period on the deal. This is where we're going to need to reflect that amortization expense. The way we're going to do this is actually on the assumptions page, because that's how we originally set up the model. Our model is linked back to our assumptions page. We're going to change our assumption here. It will flow through the model. So if we go back to our assumptions tab, and if we go to line 14, to row 14 on our assumptions tab, between amortization and SG&A, first thing I want to do is insert a row. So Alt-IR will insert a row. Okay, using the shortcuts we talked about yesterday. And I want to type in this new cell, amortization period in years. And in B14, let's type in five. Actually, you know what, let's put it in H14. That's already formatted blue. Type in the letter, the number five. And right now, the formatting on this should be, you'll see that it's in dollar signs. We need to change that formatting. That's not a dollar amount, that's the number of years over which we're going to amortize those fees. If you go up, you can go to your, uh, your comma icon, or you can hit Control-1 and get the pop-up window. I think in this case it's a little quicker to hit the comma icon, right. just so the dollar sign goes away. And now that we have that, <coughs> what I want to calculate is the amortization expense for each period. Again, on our pro forma balance sheet, we have eight million in fees, financing fees that got capitalized. They'll be amortized over five years. So for each period, what I want to do is take those fees, so equals F16 on the pro forma balance sheet. I want to lock on that, because I'm going to copy that across, divided by that cell we just populated, H14. Also lock on that. And you should get 1.6. So again, that formula <coughs> equals F16 on the pro forma balance sheet. Lock on it. So hit F4 to lock. Divided by H14 on this assumptions tab. You'll also lock on that because we're going to copy that across. You should get 1.6. Change the font color to black. This is no longer a hard code. This is output. 
and then you can fill that to the right. Control R to fill right. Same command we used last week. And this is what your model should look like right now. You should have 1.6 million of amortization expense in each year. It should be formatted black because it's output. Okay, now the way, again, the way we set this up is our model linked back to these numbers. So now when we go to our model tab, control page down will take us to our model tab. You should see in your amortization line item 1.6 million every year. So that additional expense is rolling in, getting taken out in the calculation of um, in the calculation of EBIT, but then getting added back for EBITDA. Where else would that get added back as well? Cash flow statement, right. One of the first things in our account, we, we start off with net income, we add back depreciation and amortization, so that's getting added back down in our cash flow statement too. All right, well, let's move on to the balance sheet. And just like with the income statement, we're going to work straight down from the top. All right, cash, line item for cash, actually does not change again. This comes right from the end of our cash flow statement. The link is, ar is already correct. Once we get the cash flow statement done, that will update automatically. So we don't need to make any changes there. We also don't need to make any changes to our working capital accounts. At this point, remember, we didn't change any of our operating assumptions. So these are, these are fine. We can leave these alone. All right, but the first place I do want to make a change is actually in the gross PP&E line item. And to understand why we need to make a change, we actually just need to look closely at this formula. So I'll hit F2 to show this formula. And we see that here's the problem. This number, the first year gross PP&E, is keying off of our historical balance sheet. And I mentioned yesterday that once the transaction is done, the historical balance sheet is pretty much worthless for us. All right, so any references to anything in the historical balance sheet need to be updated so that we're keying off the pro forma balance sheet. What this means in Excel terms is any time here in year one where we see a reference to anything in column G, we need to change that to an H. And in this case, for the, for the gross PP&E number, it's not going to make a difference to the number right now. But if later on we went back and changed our CapEx assumption, or if we made a change to our pro forma balance sheet and the purchase price accounting and those numbers moved a little bit, it would, uh, it would force our model to be off. So we do need to update this. Basically, the update is very easy. We can change G to H. And only in that first year. If you look at year two, it's keying off the prior year. Year three is keying off the prior year. It's only in year one. Again, we need to change that reference from G53 to H53 for gross PP&E. And we also need to do the same thing for cumulative depreciation. We want to key off the pro forma balance sheet, not the historical. Okay, so once we get those done, uh, we get down to our intangible accounts, our amortizable intangibles, and our goodwill. And if you just look at these numbers and compare those numbers to the pro forma balance sheet numbers, you'll see that something needs to change. All right, we've got $8 million of amortizable intangibles on the pro forma balance sheet. Right now, we've got zero for each line item in the projection years. All right, in our pro forma balance sheet, we also have 70.2 million of goodwill, but we only have five in the projection years. We need to make some changes here and update those figures. For the amortizable intangibles, Basically, what we need to do here is we need to take into account the amount that's on our pro forma balance sheet, and then we need to amortize those as we've already done in our income statement every year. All right, so each year, this is going to go down by that 1.6 million that we just calculated. All right, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a, uh, if we set up depreciation, or how we look at accumulated depreciation, we take last year's balance, minus or we, we take into account this year's depreciation expense. Here we're going to take last year's um, amortizable intangibles, so H57, minus this period's amortization expense, or minus I17. Okay, so that formula again, H57 minus I17, last year's balance minus this year's amortization expense. And as we would expect, we get 6.4 in year one. It just goes down by 1.6. We can fill that to the right. 
F9 to recalc. And now you should see those amortizable intangibles being fully amortized down to zero by the end of year five, consistent with our assumption. Remember on the assumptions table, we said we'd amortize them over five years, so at the end of five years, they'll be zero. And then for goodwill, it's an even simpler update, and we can see exactly what the problem is when we open up that cell formula. We see it's keying off the, pro form or the historical balance sheet, just like we did up above when we did our gross PP&E and our cumulative depreciation. This needs to now key off the pro forma balance sheet. And we only need to make that change in year one. So if you change the G to an H in year one, hit F9 to recalc, all of the subsequent years will automatically update. Remember, we can't amortize goodwill anymore, so that balance is just going to stay flat. Like I said yesterday, today we're going to be doing really just a lot of Excel work. There's really not much finance that we're doing um, from this point out. It's basically just Excel, updating a lot of links, references, as you saw yesterday, inserting rows, inserting columns, reconfiguring our worksheet to accommodate the things we need with respect to the LBO model. And so LBO model is not that, LBO modeling really isn't that difficult. You pretty much understand all the finance you need to understand right now. It can be a little tedious though with all the Excel. Okay, let's keep moving on. The liabilities and equity side of the balance sheet. Again, our current, our working capital liabilities, AP, accrued liabilities, other current liabilities, no changes. Remember those operating accounts are going to stay the same. All right, first place we do need to make a change is the existing debt. Remember what happened to the existing debt when we closed the transaction, this debt was refinanced. It was paid down to zero, it's never coming back. So we need to have zero balances out here for these projection periods. Easy way to do that is say for the revolving credit facility, just set year one equal to the pro forma balance sheet amount. So in year one, say equals H68, we can fill that to the right, and we can also fill that down. At the end of the day, our goal is to have all of these be zeroed out. It got paid off, it's never coming back. Right, moving right along. On the new debt, what we're going to do here is rather than create a whole new debt schedule and insert 40 or 50 different rows, and start that from scratch. We're actually going to, when we get down to the debt schedule, we're going to use everything we've set up here to um, calculate the interest expense and the amortization on our new debt as well. All right, so we're going to use a lot of what we've already set up in this model. Um, so what I want to do is actually in the balance sheet, I'm going to link down to these ending balances in each of the situations where I can do that. And then we'll update those numbers later today when we get down to that. So for the revolver, for example, what I want to say is equals I-125. It's that ending revolver balance. And right now, I know the number is wrong. We're not going to have 172.1 million. Right? But the link we want to establish now so that when we update the debt schedule, the values will automatically update properly up above. So for year one revolver, equals I-125. For our term loan, it should be equals I-132. Now for our senior bonds, remember in the old model we didn't have any senior bonds. We had a revolver, we had a term loan, we had an unsecured piece. We didn't have senior bonds, so we don't have a place in our debt schedule to amortize or calculate interest on the senior bonds. What we need to do here is I need to leave a placeholder. I need to leave a reminder for myself that when I get the, when I make room for the senior bonds in the debt schedule, when I complete the analysis of the senior bonds in the debt schedule, then I'll have something to link to. But right now I have nothing to link to. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to color this cell yellow. And all I did was go to the paint can, colored it yellow, you color it blue, black, green, whatever. Just make it stand out for yourself so that when you're reviewing your model later, you know, hey, I'm still not done. I need to update this. Right. Normally, I don't like to leave placeholders, but sometimes I just have to. Like I said, I don't have anything to link to just yet. 
So create whatever placeholder you need. I highlighted it as yellow. And then for the unsecured debt, we can link down to cell I-139, the ending balance on our unsecured debt, just as we did with the revolver and the term loan. And once we have those cells all updated, we can fill those to the right, F9 to recalc. And again, the values that you see in these cells right now are not going to be correct, but the links are correct. And that's the important thing. In the real world, I probably would create a whole new debt schedule for each of those four new pieces of debt. But it's pretty time consuming, it's pretty tedious. We really don't have time to do that here, so that's why we're using the existing area that we blocked off down below. Um, our, un our other liabilities, we don't need to make a change to that. That's from just referring back to our assumptions tab, and again, we're not changing any of the assumptions on the operating, or the operating assumptions. Okay, but I do need to make two more changes in my model. My last two line items, my shareholders' equity, retained earnings, and common stock. If we open up the formula for retained earnings, we can see quite obviously why we need to change that. It's keying off of the old historical balance sheet figure. And again, when we bought the company, all those old retained earnings got wiped away. We bought out all the equity, those got wiped away. We started out anew. What we need to do is change that reference to G82 to H82. We need retained earnings to basically reset, key off of what was listed in the pro forma balance sheet, that deficit retained earnings of six million. All right, so if you update that in year one, hit F9 to recalc, all of the other subsequent years will automatically update. You just need to make that change in year one. And then for our common stock, if we look at this formula, it's referring back to the assumptions tab. We can, we can update this in one of two ways. We can go back to the assumptions tab and change our common stock assumption to equal are the equity that we're putting in the deal, or we can just set year one equal to the pro forma balance sheet amount and fill that to the right. And I think that's what I'm going to do. It's just a little easier. All right, so again, in year one, set common stock equal to um, cell H83, and then fill that across to the right. Basically, what we're saying is that common stock is going to remain unchanged. We don't anticipate any owner withdrawals. We don't anticipate any additional equity infusions during our holding period. Common stock will stay level. Does that make sense? And again, make sure you hit F9 to recalc. We're in manual mode. Otherwise, your numbers will not match mine. And at this point, not surprisingly, our balance sheet is way off. Okay, you should see very large numbers in your check line, in this case large and negative numbers, and that's okay. And again, we're not finished with our model, so I wouldn't expect the balance sheet to balance just yet. It's probably a good time to save, just a quick control S, save our work. Now we'll move on to the cash flow statement. Okay, so if we look at the cash flow, first line item, net income, just keying off of our income statement above. We don't need to make any changes to this. All right. net, net income will change based on updating the interest expense and having that flow through the income statement, but we don't need to make any changes here. Depreciation and amortization, also no change. We made our change to amortization above. We can see that that's getting picked up down below in that this includes both I-16 depreciation and I-17 amortization. But I do want to insert a row right below that. So if you go to line 93, use our Alt-IR to insert a row. What I want to do is insert a line item for pick interest. Remember, one piece of our debt, that mezzanine piece, our interest is going to get paid in kind. It's not getting paid in cash. And think of that as almost like a depreciation or an amortization figure. It's an expense that runs through the income statement, but it's a non-cash expense. 
And as we know from accounting rules, we need to add back non-cash items in our cash flow. So once we calculate our pick interest later today in our debt schedule, we're going to want that to be added back here. Okay, so we've made, a, made room for that. I also, because at this point we don't have anything to link to, I'm gonna leave another placeholder. Just a reminder, visual cue telling me that once I get my debt schedule done, I still need to come back and establish that link. Does everyone understand why we're doing that for pick interest? Okay. Well, let's, work in, let's look at our working capital items now. And if we look at the very first working capital item accounts receivable, if we hit F2 to look at that formula, we see that indeed this is still queuing off of our historical balance sheet. We, still, we see a reference to column G. Remember what I said earlier, anytime we see a reference to our historical balance sheet or column G, we need to change that to H. And there's two ways I could do that. Number one, I could go through and each line item I could change to H, and do that one by one. What I'm going to show you how to do, though, is to do this real quickly using a find and replace within Excel. All right, so the first thing I want you to do, select all of these working capital items in year one, in year one only. Again, to select multiple cells, hold down shift, use your down arrow key. Select that range, and what I want you to do is hold down Control and hit H. Control H is a shortcut for find and replace. And I believe it also works in, I believe that shortcut will also work in Word, PowerPoint, etc. So kind of a nice shortcut to use. You should get a pop-up box, like the one I've got here, saying in line one, find what and then in line two, replace with whatever we specify. And in that find what line, I want to type G. Replace with, I want to type H. Make sure, this is really important, make sure you've only selected those, that range of cells that we mentioned a moment ago. Okay? If you do a global find and replace, every G in your model is going to be changed to an H. Anytime it happens in the text, or in the cell references, so be very careful. Make sure you've selected only that range. Find G, replace with H. Then you can tab over until replace all is highlighted. Hit enter. You get a pop-up here saying Excel has completed its search and made seven replacements, which makes sense. We selected seven cells. Each had one G, so it got replaced. And now if we look at any of those cells in year one, you'll see that we've got no references left to column G. All right, just kind of a quick and easy way to do a find and replace. And we only need to do that in year one. All, right, all of the other years are already correct. The reason it's just in year one is we inserted a column for the pro forma balance sheet between column G and column I, and that's why. All right, so that gets us through our cash from operations Cash from, cash from investing section, we actually don't need to make any changes. Again, all of our operating assumptions stay the same. Um, if we did want to make changes, we'd make them on the assumptions tab, not here. And then lastly, our, our cash flow from financing section. If we look at that change in revolver formula, first of all, there are two problems here, actually. Right, number one, when you hit F2, you'll see that that formula includes a G. So there's some reference to the historical balance sheet, so we know that's wrong. But secondly, if we look at the row number, row 68, if we scroll up, row 68 is our old revolver. Remember that old revolver goes away, it gets paid off. So what I want to do, rather than editing that formula, I'm just going to overwrite it. And what I want that formula to say is equals, what is that, I-120, um, or I-73, um, examining changes in the new debt, not the old debt. And I want to be keying off our pro forma balance sheet, not the historical one. All right, so for that change in revolver, let's just overwrite that formula. Type in equals I-73 minus H-73. 
So that formula should be equals I73 minus H73. What I want to do is I want to fill that across to the right, because that's going to apply in every year. All right, so fill that to the right, and then I want to fill it down one, and only one, because up in the balance sheet, the term loan is right below the revolver, so we can fill that down one and get that proper formula. Before we copy that to the unsecured debt line, we've actually got to insert a line for the change in senior bonds. So just fill that across to the right and then fill it down just one, one row to the term loan and hit F9 to recalc and you should have numbers like what I've got here. All right, let's move on. As I mentioned a second ago, we do not as, the, as of this moment, we don't have a space in our financing section for the change in the senior bonds, so we need to insert a row. So if you highlight any cell on row 112, that change in unsecured debt line, we'll hit Alt-IR, and I want to type in change in senior bonds. And then what we can do is we can actually take the formulas in the row for the change in the term loan. If you select all five of these, cells, basically the range from, I guess, what is it, it's I-111 to, uh, to M-111, control C to copy, and then if you select as your destination range both the change in senior bonds and the change in unsecured debt, we'll use an Alt-ESF paste special formulas, because we want to preserve that underline and the change in unsecured debt line. So Alt ESF is in Frank to paste, F9 to recalc, and your numbers should update and they should look like what we have here. Again, all I did was copy the change in term loan formula, use the paste special formulas to paste it in the change in senior bonds and change in unsecured debt lines. Okay, well that's really all we need to make as far as changes go in the cash flow statement, our total cash flow line is just going to be changing cash from operations, cash from investing, cash from financing. We've already updated those. Okay, but we do need to update our beginning cash position. If we look at that cell reference, it's referring to cell G120. All right, we know now anything in G is the historical balance sheet. We need to change that to be linking to the um, pro forma balance sheet. So now I could do I could do this one of two ways. I could just change this G to an H, and it would be referring to this cell here. But this cell is blacked out, right? I know it's blank. There's no number in there. But if for some reason a number gets mistakenly entered in there, this is blacked out. We'd never see it. So what I'd rather do in this year one, just to be safe, is say equals and then scroll up to my pro forma balance sheet and link to cell H47. It's just safer that way in year one. Hit enter. And then years two, three, four, and five, we can leave alone. <coughs> They're referring to the prior years ending cash right there in row 120, which is fine there because we can see it. My only concern here was this is blacked out and I don't really know what's going on in that cell unless I put my cursor there and highlight it. All right, everybody have that? And now our cash flow is done. <coughs> Again, the numbers will continue to update, but the, uh, all the links and the formulas in there are correct. But I do, need, I do need to make a change in my change or my cash flow before revolver line item. All right, anybody tell me why? It's kind of a review what this represents, but can anybody tell me why I need to make a change in this cell? Um, no, because we're, you know, for our debt, changes in debt, we're referring to it right here. And we've already changed, so we're referring to the new debt and the old. We've already done that. But what would this, what does this cash flow before revolver sell? What is it missing right now? Change in senior bonds. If we F2 on that, open up that cell formula, we see that we've got our change in our term loan and change in unsecured debt. It's not referring to the change in senior bonds because they weren't there before. And so what I want to do is hit F2 on this cell, just like I did, 
And then at the end of that cell, type plus I112. And you should see that change in senior bond cell get highlighted. Remember, this cell, this change in cash before revolver, needs to measure all of our changes in our cash flow before we look to the revolver. That also needs to include the senior bonds. So we'll change that in year one, and then we need to fill that across to the right because all five years did not include, did not include that um, reference. Probably a good time to save as well. So just control S real quick. And then we'll start working on our debt schedule. Okay, well let's keep moving on. Let's start on, start on our debt schedule. Let's work on a revolver. And the first thing uh, we need to change is that first cell, beginning revolver balance. If we look at it, okay, obviously it's referring to the old balance sheet, so that's wrong. Um, it's also referring to the wrong row number. Let's just overwrite this cell. I want to say equals. Beginning revolver balance is the same thing as saying last year's ending balance, last period's ending balance. So I want to link to my ending balance on my pro forma debts or pro forma balance sheet, which is cell H73. Just for year one. Okay, year two, three, four, and five, those are each referring to the prior year's ending balance right there in the debt schedule. So we're, we're okay there. Just change year one to refer to the pro forma balance sheet, cell H73. And hit F9 to recalc, otherwise your numbers won't match mine. Okay, our pay down drawdown line, no change here. We've got our minus min formula. Nothing's going to change with respect to that. Right, that's automatically figuring out what we can pay down or what we need to draw down or borrow. Our ending balance is correct. It's just the sum of our beginning balance and any pay downs or drawdowns. But as you recall, our interest rates have now changed. Remember last time when we first did this model, we had our interest rates. They floated off of LIBOR. Now the interest rates have changed. Our revolver interest rate, as we specified on our source and use tab, is now 7% and it's a fixed interest rate. So what I want to do here is link back to my source and use tab. I want to link to that 7% and lock on that, and then I'll copy that across. So in year one, I want to say equals. I'm scrolling up to my source and use tab. And I want to link to cell I-17 on the source and use tab, 7%, and then hit F4 to lock. Hit enter and then fill that across to the right, F9 to recalc. And in year one, right now you should have 4.2 million of interest, 8.3 in year two, 8.2, 8.0, 7.6 in year five. Again, make sure you lock. If you don't lock, your interest rate will be wrong in those last four years. Anyone still need a minute? Okay, let's go to the term loan. All right, same thing here. The term loan, if we look at our beginning balance, it's referring to that old balance sheet. Just like I did with my revolver, I want to link this to my pro forma balance sheet. I want to say equals, and it's going to be H74. At 120 million. And only, I'm only doing that in year one. Again, year two, three, four, and five are just linked to the prior year's ending balance right there. So we just need to update year one. In the case of the term loan, however, I do need to change my amortization. And we didn't talk about that yesterday. We didn't do anything about that yesterday. But if we look at our instructions page, under the sources section on page one, we talk about the term loan. The last line in that section says amortize $20 million for four years and then pay off the balance at the end of year five. All right, so we are going to fully amortize the term loan down to zero. If we look at our amortization schedule right now, the first four years are correct, right? but in year five, when I hit F9 to recalc, okay, we still have another 20 million that we need to pay down. Right, so what I want to do, because this is how we've set it up, is I want to go back to my assumptions tab. I want to go down to row 45 on the assumptions tab. And in my term loan amortization, 
what I want to say is I want to change year five instead of 20, I want to change that to 40. Because so I know that's my ending balance or my beginning balance in year five. I want to fully amortize that. We'll just change that last year to 40. When we hit F9 to recalc, now our term loan does indeed get paid down to zero by the end of year five. Then our ending balances do not change, at least the formulas don't change. Those are correct. But just like with the revolver, we need to change the interest rate. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I want to say equals, go up to my source and use, sell I18, I18, hit F4 to lock. We want to capture that 7.5% and then we'll copy that across for each of the four years. Fill that across to the right. Hit, hit F9 to recalc. Make sure that you do have 7.5% every year. Make sure you locked on that cell properly. And our interest expense calculation, no change is required there. Just like before, just like last week, it'll calculate based on an average balance methodology. As we pay down more and more of our term loan, our interest gets lower and lower every year. 8.3 in year one, going down to 1.5 million by year five. Any questions? Anybody still need a minute? Okay, well the next line item in our debt schedule so far is this unsecured debt, all right? We need to, before we can do our unsecured debt, we actually need to insert some rows so we can accommodate our senior bonds. So I wanna insert um, actually seven rows. So if you highlight cell, if you put your cursor in cell A138, Hold down shift, down arrow six times, alt IR, insert seven rows at a time. Now rather than typing everything, typing everything out, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to copy the text from up above for my term loan. I'm going to copy all these items, I'm going to paste them down here, and then I'll do a find and replace and just replace the term term loan with senior bonds. Saves me some time, saves me from probably making several mistakes in the typing. So control C to copy, control V to paste. And then before I do a find and replace, make sure we only select Brian, <laughs> these, <coughs> these seven cells here, where we just pasted control H, and what I want to do is find what? I'm going to find the term, or the phrase term loan. I want to replace that with senior bonds. And replace all, and your debt schedule. The text in that section should now be updated. We've got a section for senior bonds. Next thing I want to do before I start putting numbers in here, or putting formulas in, is I actually want to copy the formatting from my term loan section as well. All right, this will just save me time later on from having to go in and reformat every single line item here. So I want to select those five projection, five projected years for my term loan. Control C to copy. I want to move my cursor down to I-139, which is the first line of our senior bonds debt schedule. And I want to type Alt-E-S-T, paste special formats. I'm pasting, but all I'm pasting are the formats. As we talked about yesterday, it's the same thing if you're used to using that, that uh, paintbrush icon. All right, this is the keyboard shortcut to doing that. Just paste special formats. Okay. Well, let's start creating our debt schedule for the senior bonds. Senior bonds beginning balance, I want to say equals. I'm going to scroll up to cell H75. Just like I did with my revolver and term loan, I want to take this from my pro forma balance sheet. So I want to pick up cell H75, that 90 million. Okay, for my pay down drawdown, if we look at our instructions page, we have no amortization on these bonds. But like I said last week, I don't want any hard codes in this. On my model tab, this needs to be output. The way I'm going to incorporate this is I'm going to go back to my assumptions tab and what I'm going to do is between my term loan amortization 
in row 45 and my unsecured debt amortization in row 46, I'm going to insert a line item for my senior bonds amortization. So highlight or put your cursor in row 46, Alt IR to insert a row and type senior bonds amortization. You can see why I don't normally type. And for each year I just want to enter zero. As I alluded to last week, we try and set up our model to be as flexible as possible. As you get into a real live deal, deal terms change, debt terms change. Nothing is set in stone until a deal is closed. So if there's a change in our amortization, the way I'm setting up our model is that I can quickly and easily enter it here, and then that will automatically flow through to my model tab. So once we have that, let's go back to our model tab. And what we want to do is say in cell I-140, my pay down or drawdown in year one, I want to say minus, control page up, H46 on the assumptions tab. That amortization that we just specified on our assumptions tab. And we can fill that across to the right for each year. Senior bonds ending balance year one. We'll just take the sum of the two items above. And the way we set it up, we can actually do that alt equals as our shortcut for a sum function. So alt equals will just give us the sum of those two numbers in I-139 and I-140. We can fill that across to the right as well. And then for our beginning balance in years two, three, four, and five, we're going to set this up the same way we did for our revolver and term loan. Beginning balance in any particular year simply equal to last year's ending balance. So for year two, we'll say equals I-141. And then we'll fill that across to the right three cells. All right, well, let's specify our interest rate. Again, linking back to the source and use. In this case, cell I-19. Make sure we lock on that. So F4 to lock. We'll fill that across to the right. We should have 9.5% in every year. And then for our interest expense calculation, we can actually just copy our formulas down from our term loan section. Control C to copy, Control V to paste. Because these are all set up in the same order. These formulas just can be copied down. And when you copy those, hit F9 to recalc, you should get 8.6 million of interest every year for the senior bonds. 90 million times 9.5%. All right, let's do our unsecured debt. First of all, our beginning balance, same exercise as we've done before. We're going to link to our pro forma balance sheet. I want to link to H76, that's 60 million. If you hit F9 to recalc, you should see 60 million straight across. Beginning balance, no amortization, 60 million ending balance. When we get to the interest rate section here, Remember this unsecured debt, interest is going to be paid in kind on this. But what I want to do is I want to set this up two ways. I want to set it up so that we can either have the unsecured debt pay interest in cash or in kind. Here's what I want to do. I want to go to row A151 and I want to insert two rows. And I want to copy the text in cells A149 and A150, the interest rate expense and interest rate, or inter interest rate and interest expense, those two line items, control C to copy. And I want to paste those into the two new rows that we just entered, or that we inserted. And now what I want to do is I want to go back into cell A149, hit F2. Um, I want to move my cursor, you should see your cursor flashing here, move it back to the beginning of that cell, and right before interest rate, I want you to type cash. And I want you to do that in the next cell as well, so that the first one reads cash interest rate, the second reads cash interest expense. Now on A151, I want to do the same thing, but instead of saying cash interest rate, I want to say pick interest rate, capital P-I-K stands for pay in kind. And I want to do that in cell A152 as well. And now we've got the option. 
We can set up our unsecured debt to have cash interest. We can set up our unsecured debt to have pick interest. Let's move on. Cash interest rate, year one. Don't just zero this out. Let's link back to our source and use. I'll say equals. And we want to pick up cell I-20 on our source and use. That cash pay interest rate for the unsecured notes is 0% right now. So I-20, lock on that, fill that to the right, F9 to recalc, and your cash interest expense should go to zero in every year. Now the next thing I want to do before I fill in my pick interest expense and my pick interest rate, I want to copy and paste the formats from my cash interest rate and cash interest expense line, when I inserted the rows below here, that dollar sign format applies to both of these new rows, but the first one needs to be a percentage. Actually, you can just copy the first. If you just copy the cash interest rate line from your, um, from row I-149, from row 149, control C to copy, alt E S T is in Thomas, paste formats, paste special formats. Now this new pick interest rate row will be formatted with a percentage. A moment ago it was formatted with dollar signs. <coughs> Let's specify our pick interest rate. Let's go back to our source and use. And I want to select cell J20, our 10% pick interest rate. I want to hit F4 to lock on that. Fill that across to the right. Hit F9 to recalc, you should have 10% in every year. And now we can calculate our pick interest expense. Pick interest expense is going to be calculated a little differently than how we calculate cash interest. A cash interest, remember, is calculated based on using an average balance, average of the ending and beginning. Pick interest, we're going to calculate off of the beginning balance. So what I want to say here is equals beginning balance, or I-146 times I-151 should get six million and I want to fill that across to the right. Right now you should have interest, pick interest expense of six million in every year. So far. All right, but conceptually this doesn't really make sense yet. Remember what we said about pick interest is it gets accrued and added on to each year's ending balance. We need to make one more change here to reflect that. For the unsecured debt ending balance, I want to hit F2, so I want to edit this cell. And right now it's saying beginning balance plus any pay down or drawdown. On the end of that formula, I want to add in the pick interest. I want to say plus, and then if you hit F2 again, then you can use your arrow key and move around. But at the end of that cell, I want to say plus I-152, pick interest. Remember, pick debt is like, negative, like a negative amortizing loan. The balance gets bigger and bigger every year to include that interest expense. And once we have that in year one, we'll fill that across to the right. And you should see, if you've done this correctly, you should see your, pick int or your, your unsecured debt ending balance growing from 66 million in year one to 96.6 million by the end of year five. Just adding that interest every year, paying interest on interest. Well, as we talked about before, we've set this up to be either, we can set it up so it's either ca interest is paid in cash or pick. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give you an example. You don't need to do this on your own, but just follow what I'm doing on the screen. Let's say we're going through, the deal terms are, are ever changing and for whatever reason, the lender says, comes back and says, you know what, pick is out. We're not doing pick anymore. Interest is going to need to be paid in cash. Well, the way we've set this up is we can make a very quick s switch here on our source and use tab. We can change our cash interest rate to 10%. Let's zero out our pick interest rate. Go back to our model, F9 to recalc. And now we see that we're bearing interest in cash, not pick. Because that interest is getting paid in cash, the balance stays the same. It's no longer increasing as it was in the pick scenario. All right, so that's a really easy way that we've built some flexibility into our model to account for either 
either cash or pick as the situation dictates. So change those back, back to my model, F9 to recalc. My pick interest rolls back in and we see it just the way it was set up a minute ago. Right. Everybody understand how we did that? Makes sense? You now know how to model pick interest. It's pretty easy once you learn how to do it. There's one more thing, actually a couple more steps we're going to have to take into account in our cash flow in a moment. I talked about one, we'll talk about the other in a moment as well. All right. But at this point, all four pieces of debt have been completed. Last couple things we need to do on our debt schedule, we need to calculate our total interest expense. We're going to add a line item to distinguish between total interest and cash interest. And then we need to recalculate our interest earned on, or change the formula for our interest earned on cash item. All right, first things first, we'll look at interest ex total interest expense. If I look at this formula, right now this formula is taking into account only three items. All right, it's taking into account interest on the revolver, interest on the term loan, and cash interest on the unsecured debt. All right, which was right before, but now we have four pieces of debt and now one of those pieces of debt also has pick interest. So we need to pick up in this formula, we need to pick up our interest expense from our senior bonds right here. We also need to pick up our pick interest because total interest expense needs to include both cash and pick. So on the end of this formula, what I want to do is I want to type plus, and then if you hit F2 again, you can now scroll with your cursor, or move your cursor around, plus I143, which is my interest expense relative to my senior bonds, plus I-152, my pick interest on my unsecured notes. So once you've done this correctly, the formula should read as follows. It should be equals I-129 plus I-136 plus I-150 plus I-143 plus I-152. I'll hit enter. We'll fill that across to the right. We'll hit F9 to recalc. And your numbers should look like this. You should have 25.9 million in year one, 28 million, 27 million, 25.9 million in year four, 24.5 million in year five. Total interest expense. Well, as I mentioned earlier, one of the first things I mentioned in class today is we only had, we had very few changes in our income statement interest expense would change automatically once we updated the debt schedule. So if we scroll back to our income statement, we'll see that our total interest expense line has updated up here. We've now got more interest expense than we had in our original model, which makes sense. We've got a lot more debt. And that flows through, it reduces our pre-tax income, reduces our net income, which is flowing all the way through our model. All right, so we have total interest expense. But as I mentioned a moment ago, what I want to do here is I'm going to differentiate between my total interest <coughs> expense and my cash interest expense. The reason I'm going to do this um, is from a lender's perspective, lenders may set covenants on either total interest expense or maybe just that cash portion. So it's important to distinguish between the two. What I want to do is first insert a row. So I want to go to A155, Alt-IR, and I'm going to type cash interest expense. And here I want to say equals I-129 plus I-136 plus I-143 plus I-150. Everything except the pick interest. Because remember, pick interest is a non-cash charge, so a lender might be interested in setting their covenants only on cash charges including cash interest expense, maybe CapEx, maybe working capital, growth, taxes, those types of things. And then the last item, interest earned on cash. Actually, it looks like this one is correct. Um, I am checking, all I did was check this formula to make sure there was no references to column G. <coughs> and as it turns out, we had set it up correctly to begin with. All right, so at this point, we're done with our debt schedule. But we still have a little work left in our model. We still have a couple placeholders that we need to fill in. All right, so we need to scroll back up. I'm going to go back up to my balance sheet to the new debt line item. 
Remember what I said earlier, senior bonds, previously we had nothing to link to in the debt schedule, now we do. So I need to create a link here to link to my ending balance on my senior bonds in each year. So in year one, I'm going to say equals, scroll down to my debt schedule, I-141 senior bonds ending balance, 90 million. I'm also going to get rid of the, f the, uh, the coloring in that cell. Then I'm going to fill that across to the right, hit F9 to recalc. Just did the same thing there that I'd done for the other three pieces of debt. Next placeholder is my pick interest in my cash flow. Remember, we need to add back pick interest because it's non-cash. So what I, what I want to say in year one, I want to say equals. I want to scroll down to that pick interest line that I just put in my unsecured debt portion of my debt schedule. Cell I-152, so equals I-152, it's going to be that six million in year one. Also want to get rid of the coloring there because I've now completed that. Fill that across to the right. And now that's flowing through my cash flow statement as an add back. Now there's still actually one more item that I need to do here because I'm not completely done. And if we look down <coughs> into my change, into our in change in unsecured debt line item, we'll see what that is. Right now, our change in unsecured debt shows a $6 million change. Our unsecured debt is growing by $6 million. The way our cash flow is set up is it's taking this into account as though this is a borrowing. All right? But why is that unsecured debt getting, why is that balance growing? Not, it's our pick interest. It's our accrued interest. It's not cash coming into the company. It's not a source of cash. All right? So just as we added it back up above, we need to back it out down below because it's not really a source of cash here. So what, what I want to do here is modify this formula. So I'm going to hit F2. I'm just doing this for the unsecured debt because none of the other pieces of debt have pick interest. And at the end of that formula, I want to say minus I-152, my pick interest. F9, or fill that to the right, F9 to recalc. Okay, from a cash flow perspective, there really is no change in our unsecured debt. From a cash flow perspective. And now my balance sheet should balance, and it does. That's when you scroll up to your check figure all right, it shows that my, I am in balance, so I'm, I'm basically done modifying my financial model at this point. We're not done with the LBO model, but this portion of the exercise is complete.